So welcome to episode 9 of the Think Wildlife podcast. Today we have Pamela Gail Malotra, the co-founder of Save Animal Initiative. It's the first private wildlife center in India based in the Kodugu district of Karnataka. My first question is, um, what made you decide to set up the Save Animal Initiative Sanctuary? Uh, the sanctuary was a childhood dream I have always had of having a forest and wildlife sanctuary. And that was uh, greatly influenced by my mother, who was uh, part Native American, and the amount of love she had for wildlife and um, forests and natural places. So uh, after I met my husband, Anil, uh, he helped me to realize that dream uh, here in India. First, though, we had a small sanctuary in Hawaii on the Big Island uh, that was also forest, backed up against the forest preserve of that um, island, the Big Island, where the volcano is always going off. And then when we shifted to India, we first tried to set up the sanctuary in the Himalayas, uh, but that didn't work because of land sealing acts. And then my husband found the lands down here in Karnataka, in the Kodugu district, which were abandoned plantation lands that the owners had basically abandoned because they couldn't make money off of them because of the uh, excess rainfall that they got here, because this is a rainforest area. So it was my dream that my husband turned into a reality based initially on just my extreme love of wildlife and forests, uh, which he shared. Now, of course, it becomes much more important because of climate change and protection of watersheds and uh, biodiversity and things like that. But it started as fulfillment of a childhood dream. You had a sanctuary in Hawaii. What made you shift to India? Uh, The initial reason we came to India was my father-in-law, Anil's father got seriously ill here in India, in Pune. He was in Pune at his at my mother-in-law's ashram, and um, he got seriously ill. And after he passed away, about six months after we had arrived, we took his asti up to Haridwar, and we fell in love with the Himalayas because we had lived in the Rocky Mountains before that. And um, so we tried to replicate what we had, what we had in Hawaii in the Himalayas. But again, land sealing acts made those impossible. Um, and then we did not sell our uh, sanctuary on the Big Island in Hawaii until after my husband found these lands here in Kodoku District, which were uh, 10 times more land area. And therefore, more biodiversity, more wildlife, more everything compared to what we had in Hawaii. What is the three-pronged approach of uh, SAI? Uh, Well, the first is acquisition, uh, reclamation, and rewilding of uh, of abandoned lands or lands in general. Uh, That is what we have done with purchasing of the lands. In addition, we have paid people who have had done illegal encroachment on government lands to vacate their encroachments so that those lands would go back to the forest that they were to begin with. We have done nothing with them except protect them so that they would return to the forest lands they once were. And then those people were able to take the money we gave them and invest in much better agricultural lands, legal lands elsewhere. And then uh, um, planting of native trees, and mainly protection of the forest areas that were existing and uh, giving Mother Nature a helping hand. Uh, And then after a time, she was doing her own seeding of the trees, et cetera, et cetera, through the various wildlife that came in a wonderful symbiotic partnership between the flora and the fauna. Uh, And the third, the second portion is uh, rescue, rehabilitation, and release. Of, of wildlife back into the wild. Uh, we have been a rehabilitation and uh, rescue and release center uh, for the forest department 
of Karnataka state government, uh, where animals that have been rescued have been brought to us, and then we have either had immediate release back in the wild or a certain amount of rehabilitation and then release. So that was the second portion. And the third is spreading awareness of how incredibly important protection of our forests and wildlife are. Because you can protect trees, but if you don't protect the wildlife, the trees will die off. The the wildlife, along with the forests and other important ecosystem systems, work together in order to make this um, ecosystem functioning and sustainable. It's Mother Nature's brilliance that has put this all together. So as forests need wildlife, wildlife needs forests. They work together to sustain this. So in order for people to understand how important this is, I've given hundreds, at least, presentations from young children all the way to college students, to business groups, to government officials, to uh, all kinds of women's groups to businesses in order to bring home the message that without our forests, we cannot survive. Whether it's from the point of view of climate change, because deforestation is the principal reason for climate change. It is also the most practical and easy answer as far as bringing, uh, mitigating the rising temperatures and for our water sources, et cetera. So it has been a a constant effort to educate people more like, and I don't even like to use the word educate. I just like to say sharing the knowledge that we gleaned over decades. That was what my autobiography has tried to do also, share the knowledge that I have gleaned over the decades of doing this work with others to help spread that awareness and hopefully inspire others with the love of nature that both my husband and I felt and have. Now, let's talk about your rehabilitation and rescue. Like normally, which species do you get at your sanctuary like for rehabilitation? And release? Um, well, we've had a number of different bird species, uh, oh. several uh members of the Alexandrian parrot species, because they are the largest parrot species here in India. And um, they are very intelligent, very loving and very friendly, which makes them a target for the illegal wildlife trade here in India and around the world, which has made them now endangered. Uh, So A number of those uh, birds, which over the years, some were able to be released right away. Others took years because they were taken, they were taken from the nest as small babies and they had to relearn what it meant to be a bird, learning how to fly, how to recognize um, uh, natural food, how to work as a flock. To, get a, to be afraid of humans, very important thing. When you release animals back in the wild, they have to be afraid of humans because otherwise they're going to get killed and poached or captured again. Uh, so those um, uh, chipmunks, uh, Indian jungle cats, turtles, certain snakes, um, uh, other small mammals, um, dormouse, uh, moles, uh, I mean, it, it, the list goes on, and somber deer. And now, obviously, your sanctuary has got a lot of uh, species such as, such as tigers, elephants, and hornbills. Uh, which has been your favorite uh, sighting over the last few years? Uh, there have been a lot of favorite sightings. One of my most favorite has been of the elephants, and actually one that happened in 2021, uh, right before monsoon set in. Uh, We have a a group of uh, a family group of elephants that come into the sanctuary a lot and give birth here because they know it's a safe place. There's abundant water and plenty of food. And one of the main older elephants is called cut tail because her tail has been cut. We have no idea how she lost most of it. She came with her older daughter and spent weeks into months here uh, last year. And our one of the most amazing sightings was uh, my husband and I and one of our cats, Shanti, 
we were coming back from our elephant pond where we had been swimming. We call it elephant pond because the elephants love it. It's very large. It's over their head. They just love swimming there too. And I heard bamboo being snapped. And then we approached the bridge, which connects the two sides of our uh, sanctuary together. And monsoon, we can't cross the river. And I went out on the bridge and it was Cuttail and her daughter. And she, she recognizes me for the years I've been videotaping her and all of that. And she, instead of turning around and going upstream, she came down. And after making sure it was my husband and me, she swam underneath the bridge that I was on, allowing me to videotape her throughout the entire course of her swimming, coming, swimming underneath and going downstream with her daughter, who came also. That has to stand out as one of the most remarkable sightings and experiences I've ever had. That's a lovely setting. So you guys also shared this setting with some tourists. So like talk about your ecotourism initiative. At- okay. The ecotourism uh, initiative is what is known as a homestay, which means we only have two cottages with two rooms in each cottage with adjoining bathrooms. Um, And that limits the number of people that we can have stay at any one time, which is good. We're very careful so that we do not overburden the ecosystem for the extra water needs or any kind of um, refuse or anything like that. And we also are very strict about taking people into the wild. They cannot go into the sanctuary without a guide. Either It was either my husband or myself or our manager because, number one, everything is done on foot. There are no Jeep safaris. So you are literally walking on the ground in the jungles where we have the elephants and the tiger and the the gaur and the other uh, large animals as well as snakes. There are plenty of snakes here, including cobra, but no wild animal has ever attacked or even threatened anyone that has been here with us because we respect their space and we will not disturb the family or come in between any family members, no matter which kind of species it is. So this initiative uh, raises a little bit of money for the sanctuary, which is very important because we we are literally footing the bill basically ourselves from our own pocket all of the time. We are a nonprofit uh, ADG recognized organization. So those who do donate get a break on their taxes in uh, India. Uh, up to 50% of what they've given us can be written off against their income taxes. So the, the homestay helps a little bit with maintenance and upkeep of the sanctuary. Uh, but it also is a, a way of being able to sow those seeds of understanding, awareness, and love of Mother Nature with those who come to us. So it is a, um, a good initiative, but we have to be very careful not to overburden the ecosystem and absolutely not to disturb the wildlife. They're, the sanctuary is for them. The ecotourism is secondary. Uh, I think this is similar to what happens in various African countries like South Africa. There's Greater Kruger Park where uh, a lot of private landowners take care of land and they allow some ecotourism and it helps conservation. So uh, do you think there is much scope for this public uh, private collaboration in the conservation field in India? I think there is scope for it, provided greed does not set in. We don't have the thousands of acres that Africa, South Africa, and other countries in the African continent have with a small population. Yes, the African population is one of the fastest growing on the earth right now, but still, we are huge in population. And that population takes up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And as a result, in addition, we are not a savanna situation. We're a jungle situation. And so it is much more difficult to even see wildlife in the jungle than it is out on the open savanna. So I do believe in the public-private partnership concept, provided it does not get 
um, saturated. Here in the Kodagu district, the homestay was the same idea, which was to help uh, raise the economic level of women in particular in the Kodagu district, which is great. But there are so many illegal, illegal homestays and resorts that the area has become saturated and now it's squeezing the wildlife out rather than providing a wonderful venue for people to go to be able to enjoy and see the wildlife at a safe, respectable distance from them. So it has to be where greed is under control. It has to be where we think of the wildlife and the wild spaces first, because the humans have to come secondary in this area. Uh, because without the wildlife and without the wild spaces, we won't be able to exist in any case. So that is, I, I think it's a possibility, but it has to be controlled. And it has to be controlled with wildlife and forests and other ecosystems coming first. And then the human aspect and the money's made out of it or whatever second. The private forest concept is something that we think could really take off very well here in India, provided there are some benefits for it. For example, if there were concepts of payment for ecosystem services where private individuals can be given even just tax relief or if not stipends, but at least some tax relief for protecting native species on their private properties. This will help us immensely with climate change, mitigating of climate change, with all the trees soaking up the CO2. The more wildlife that is documented there should increase those uh, economic benefits because studies have shown the more large wildlife there is in a forest area, the more CO2 gets sequestered. And uh, if these kinds of economic benefits can be put into the private forest concept, then that will encourage more and more people to invest in this rather than saying, oh, well, you can do ecotourism. Well, there's a limit to what you can do with that. And it is by this private partner forest wildlife concept that you can help the rest of the country through mitigation of climate change, through protecting water sources, through protecting our, our soil sources, getting our, our monsoons on time and, and helping us through the dry seasons for all these various ecosystem services that forests provide. Similar lines, so many of India's megafauna species, such as elephants, basically the entire population of wolves, quite a few leopards and tigers are found outside protected areas. So what do you think is the way forward? Because obviously... Uh, large populations are found outside the protected areas and they, they are very success, susceptible to poaching and other threats. Yes, I agree with you. And this is, this is why, first of all, I think we need a lot, a huge expansion of protected areas. That's my own feeling is there needs to be a huge expansion of protected areas, specifically piecing together the fragmented reserve forests or the fragmented uh, protected areas with biological corridors, which will allow migration of migration animals or landscape animals like elephants, like even wolves have their own territories, but they can go quite a long distance for those territories, like tigers, etc., cetera, or, or gaur. Um, by doing this, you will, you will allow this migration, which is essential, and also cut back on uh, human animal conflict because there is no reason for animals to come out of the forest as long as they have ways to go across to other areas where they're looking for food, for water, or for propagation uh, prospects. So I believe that we need to, a big expansion in protected areas. In addition, this exp this expansion can help all uh, can be helped by the private forest concept as I, I just mentioned before, and payment for ecosystem services can involve communities. It's been very successful in places like Costa Rica and elsewhere 
where they have paid the people that live near the forest areas to protect the forest trees that are there and document, document the wildlife species that they happen to come across. And they are, can be given stipends this way. They can also be given things such as I was interested in your website where you talked about the nimbu forests, the, the lemon far, uh, lemon, not forest, but the lemon um, uh, fences, fences, biofencing. Uh, I have been a big advocate for uh, beehive fencing which is something that has been very successful in Africa. Uh, and uh, I remember, I'm trying to remember why there was a question of why it wouldn't happen. Oh, I know what it was. It was the sloth bear. They said the sloth bear won't, won't leave those. Well, that may be true in some areas, but sloth bears have been ruthlessly slaughtered also. And in some of your areas, especially in the Western Cots, you have very few sloth bears. So I still think that with the beehive fencing and coupled with the nimbu, you're providing your uh, fencing aspect and protection aspect for the people that live by the forest, giving them crops that they can sell again, whether it's honey or whether it's nimbu. And... Um, creating a, 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 an atmosphere of cooperation and coexistence. But I still feel that it, even with those areas where you're talking about people living by the forest areas, they can be uh, encouraged to grow native trees that can be bought back by the forest department or by other NGOs or by businesses for replanting in other areas to help rewild parts of India that have the same tree species. So there, there's, there are ways of working with the communities. There are ways of working with the communities. A revival of, uh, of the David Akadus or sacred grove concept and the community uh, efforts in that, uh, bringing back the respect that used to be there in the older generations for the forest, for mother nature, for the creator, that is something that can be revived as well. And if there are community forest areas, there can be, again, a certain amount of help that goes in there to uh, diversify the crops that they grow there and have them diversify in areas for crops that wildlife do not like. I mean, while the wildlife are here and it was coffee, coffee growing, uh, cardamom growing areas, the wildlife had come in, but virtually do nothing because they didn't eat cardamom. So, you know, you have to think about how to help the agricultural sector without um, uh, taking away all the animals lands and then expecting them not to raid. It's not possible. They have a right to survive. And actually, these lands were theirs long before they were human humans lands. But we can work together if we are intelligent and get the greed factor out a little bit, because that's that's what really usually spoils all of these kinds of programs. Talking about agriculture, Kota goes into Western Ghats, where there's been a lot of habitat fragmentation due to uh, plantations of coffee, tea, tea, rubber. Uh, obviously, uh, the Western Ghats is a very e- eco-sensitive habitat, which has undergone severe degradation. Do you think uh, agroforestry can help revive the ecosystem in the Western Ghats? I do. I do. If it's done intelligently. Um, one of the, the things that we do is we sponsor programs for organic gardening, organic plantations. And we have uh, some very brilliant scientists in this, in this um, uh, district who are friends of ours who have organic plantations using just native trees, no, no uh, um, exotic trees. And they do what they call, they keep in their plantations things called breathing spaces. These are natural areas in the plantations that help to attract 
pests that would otherwise attack crops. And in larger areas, these biological corridors can be woven through these areas as well to connect the fragmented forest areas, as I said before. This is particularly important in the riparian or river areas, because if you help protect your riparian areas, your river areas, and you connect them, you will be helping the planters as well um, and encouraging them to grow the native trees for shade cover, etc. also helps the planters as well because it's the, shade, it's the native trees that attract the natural pollinators. It is the native trees that have the root system that can hold the excess water and release it in the dry season so that the soils stay moist year round and you've got water for your crops year round. Um, so I do believe that we can do this agroforestry if it is done intelligently. And if people are willing to forfeit uh, a little bit of land for the future by giving those little bits of land back to the forest areas, because that's ensuring their own future also. Anything that's given back to Mother Nature is going to reward us a hundredfold, a thousandfold, whether it is in lower temperatures. Right now, for example, coffee grows best at 20 degrees Celsius. Right now, even in the monsoon and the winter times, you're, you're touching 28 to 30 degrees. And so the coffee is being dried up. There's no taste to it. You're not going to have a good uh, crop to sell. So with this little investment in helping these fragmented pieces come back together, you're going to ensure better shade cover, better soil, because native trees give you better topsoil than do exotics. You will have more water during the dry season. You will have your natural pollinators. And with these biological corridors, you will have far less human animal conflict, far less crop rating, because they won't come out if they have adequate food, water, and propagation prospects there, the wildlife. It won't. It has no reason to. So talking about uh, restoration, so it'd be great if you could talk us to how you m- manage to restore the farmlands in such a productive tropical rainforest, right from the uh, selection of trees to the other habitat restoration works. Um, the lands that I that we were have bought, uh, and actually, after the first few lands, the former owners came to us and asked us to buy their lands because they were abandoned. So, um, what we did do first, if there were any forest areas. We protected them. Uh, And we were lucky that we bought these lands in the early 90s into the early 2000s. And that was before the coffee boom drove everyone insane. Once the coffee boom went, people cut down all their shade trees and went to coffee. When we bought most of the lands, most of the area was in cardamom. And cardamom is a uh, moisture-loving crop that likes a lot of shade. So there were a lot of what I would call great-grandmother trees there in those cardamom areas. And from those great-grandmother trees, um, we were able to get uh, saplings in order to regrow those native trees in similar areas in the lands that we had um, purchased. We did buy a lot of trees also, and we used native, uh, the knowledge of, of the, um, native people here. Uh, we're talking about Adivasis as well as people who have grown, who've lived their whole life here. We talked to scientists. We did talk to the forest department officials to a certain degree as well. And they were the ones who helped us choose which trees to initially plant. But it was Mother Nature that really guided us the most because she was the one who has come up with which trees grow the best in this area to begin with. So by observing her and observing what trees she was growing in the area, we were then able to plant those trees much more. At the same time, it's important to mention that we did not try 
to turn open open um, grassland areas or wetland areas into forest. Mother Nature has made those also for her own reasons. Some of the natural meadows that we have have granite just under the very bare topsoil. No, very few trees can grow there to begin with, but they're essential areas for uh, grasses that the grazers need in order to fill up on a lot of nutritious grasses through the year, especially post monsoon. So we did not try to convert those. The same with natural wetland areas. They also are a rich source of nu- nutritious food for the grazers who become the rich source of nutritious food for the predators. So we have not uh, planted trees in the wetlands either. What Where we have done it has been in what were the forest land areas originally and using Mother Nature as our main guide. That is my last question. I would like to thank you again for your time. Thank you.